Hey, welcome and thank you for tuning in again. I'm going to give you a few announcements before we're able to worship together. And uh, I am so glad we were able to have a drive-in Easter service last week. That was so much fun. It was so good to see so many of you. Thank you for coming. It was very encouraging. And uh, I wish that I could have spent more time with you all. But nevertheless, we'll be able to worship together again sometime soon in our newly renovated worship center. And we'll get to see each other face to face. I want you to know that I deeply care about you all, and if there's anything that uh, I need to know about, please just give me a call or an email, PastorCaseyButner at gmail.com, and uh, I'll respond and, and, and care for you. Also, um, I want to remind us all that on our website, BeulahBaptistWG.org, is how we're giving online, or the website uh, has our address as well, and you can mail in your offering that way, or you can text to give. I'd also like to invite you to set aside Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock. We're having Bible study online, and uh, this platform called Zoom allows us to kind of see all the faces that are on, and we can interact that way, and I'm teaching through a series on creationism, and we're having a great time. So that's at 6 o'clock, and you're receiving an email with a link. All you got to do is click on that link, and then you can be connected a few minutes before 6 o'clock, and, um, and accept that, and we'll be good to go. All right, now we get to be led in worship through uh, by Jimmy and Rick. So sit back, and, and let's worship together. Good morning. Why don't you sing with us a great song of the church at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. God's word at last my sin I learned then I trembled at the law I spurned till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burden soul found liberty at Calvary salvation's plan oh the grace that brought it down to man oh the mighty gulf that God to span at Calvary mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary sing it with me again great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burden soul found liberty at Calvary the splendor of the King he's clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great is our God! And all will see how great, how great is our God. Oh, age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God Our God and all will see. 
how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of our praise, my heart will sing. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God.
with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in a humble adoration and there proclaim turn to John chapter 4. We're going to continue on with this amazing gospel. Here we're going to see Jesus take his disciples through Samaria and he will minister to the woman at the well. So John chapter 4, we'll read here in just a moment. I'd like to preface this whole lesson with this thought or with this title, How to Love Lost People. And when we minister to lost people, I think the Apostle Paul has the best uh, perspective. He said in Romans 7 24, oh wretched man that I am. And so when we minister, we must always remember that we are just simply wretched people trying to reach wretched people. So the ground is level at the foot of the cross, so to speak. All right, John chapter 1. This is a very long text today, 42 verses. So we're going to work through as much as we can. We're going to start with point number one, distractions can take you off mission. And that's going to be the first three verses. John chapter four, verses one through three, point number one, distractions can take you off mission. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away to unto Galilee. Now, the disciples were with Jesus and the Pharisees are getting mad at them because their ministry is growing, all kinds of stuff is going on, but Jesus does not get distracted by the foolish Pharisees. Now, for us, we should also be able to discern when there's a time to stand our ground and continue in the work that God has given us, or it's time to move along. It just takes a, an element of wisdom and discernment. And so, nevertheless, there's nothing accidental when it comes to our sovereign Lord, and he left this potential hostile situation that was being drummed up by the Pharisees, and he went on and stayed on mission. Now, the mission is um, described for us in Acts 1.8, and let me read Acts 1.8 to you. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the world. I think it's fascinating that Samaria is listed in Acts 1.8, especially how the Jews felt about Samaritan people. And so, nevertheless, we are to minister indiscriminately, 
and not get distracted from that. Point number two is that discrimination can take you off of your mission. And we're going to see here in the text that Jesus had to go through Samaria. But Samaria was normally avoided. The Jews never forgot the problematic and sinful and detestable past that Samaria was known for. It started with King Omri. He's credited for building Samaria. And the Bible says in 1 Kings 16, 30 that he did more evil than any other king. So that's the history and where it starts. Now, in Nehemiah's day, there was a governor, and his name was Sanballat, and he actually mocked um, Nehemiah for trying to rebuild the walls. Let me read that account to you in Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now, it came about that when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry, and he mocked the Jews. And he spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? And are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices and can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burnt ones? Now Tobiah, Tobiah was Sanballat's friend, the Aramite, was near him and he said, Even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. And so... This is part of Samaria's history. Jews don't forget history. Amri, the evil king, and now Sanballat making fun of Nehemiah. All this is happening now even worse. The Samaritans would later embrace the Hellenization of their religion, and that just simply means that they merged in with the local false gods' uh, adherents, you know, those who are worshiping false gods. So the Samaritan... Jews incorporated other beliefs and they eventually built a temple on Mount Gerizim and dedicated that to Zeus. So now you move into Jesus' time. We've talked a little bit about the history of Samaria. Jesus is heading into Samaria and he's going to talk to the woman at the well. And now here in Jesus' time, a fierce rivalry and hatred existed between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. The Jewish folks, they had a disdain for the Samaritans, and they hated the fact that their past countrymen had compromised with their beliefs and merged in with their local enemies. Now they believed, the Jews believed, that the Samaritans were completely defiled. So Jews just simply would avoid Samaria altogether. They didn't want to go there. They would go east or they would go west all the way around Samaria, and that was a long way out of their way. If they were going north from Judea and wanted to go to Galilee, they would generally have to go through Samaria, but there was two other alternate paths. They could go to, uh, the, to Jordan and cross over that river and go north and then cross back over the river to get back into the region of Galilee, or they could go really far west to the Mediterranean Sea path and go north and then cut back over. But nevertheless, either way was a long ways, and most Jew Jews did that. So they didn't want to truck it across that sin-stained uh, terrain. That's the Samaritan history there. Yet... Jesus is taking his disciples right into Samaria. His young learners are going right into Los Angeles, so to speak, or New York, or Chicago, or New Orleans. Uh, these places um, have um, Samaritan-like people, and Jesus is going to minister to them. Let's continue reading in verse 5. So it came to a city of Samaria called Sakar. that's the capital, near a parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jacob's well was about a half a mile from Sakar. It was about 100 feet deep. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus at the well. He was slumped over. He was tired. He had walked about 20 miles. And it was about the sixth hour. That means it was about 12 o'clock noon. Verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now, this is kind of a potential argument brewing here. And 
She's talking about this age-old battle between the Samaritans and the Jews. And Jesus does not get drawn into this earthly conversation. Matter of fact, he kind of upscales it to making it a spiritual conversation and wins her over. But let me tell you just what Merrill Tenney, a, a scholar, suggests that this woman's sarcastic reply really means. She would have said it something like this in our vernacular. We Samaritans are the dirt underneath you Jews' feet. And we're not worth anything until you want something. And so that sarcastic, um, you know, potentially problematic conversation uh, was right there between Jesus and the woman. And I want to make the point that Jesus did not get drawn in. And obviously, we have to work hard as a people not to get drawn into earthly conversations like that and get trapped as well. It's more beneficial for us to focus on the soul of a person and uh, not get involved in the, 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 the local tensions, the politics, or the religious battles. We want to just go straight to heaven. You see, Jesus was more concerned about this woman's soul than entering into a conversation about the age-old battle between the two uh, Samaritans and the Jews. And so we too should be concerned about souls. Proverbs 11.30 says, He who wins souls is wise. And so it'd be easy to get drawn in to a conversation about politics, especially in our day and age when we're speaking with a lost person. But there's a, a greater thing at hand. You don't want to miss the greater opportunity to lead someone to Christ by getting drawn in to an earthly war or battle. So, this woman, she has um, a life that she's lived and plenty that has happened to her and that she's done and Jesus knows her past and he starts to bring it up a little bit and he brings up the fact that she has five husbands and, um, and she doesn't even live with the one that she has now. So, she is uh, going to respond to him in a way that she kind of stays earthly on the conversation, but Jesus keeps taking her back up to the spiritual aspect of living water. Let's read uh, the text up into verse 10 together, starting in verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since, since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan, Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And she said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us this well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? And pause right there. So we see that she's bringing up a different subject here after Jesus talks about living water. It's almost like she didn't get it right away. And she moves on to try and build up her self-sufficiency or her self-esteem or her self-worth, whatever you want to think of it as, by bringing up the fact that it is um, of our father, Jacob. Now, it is significant that uh, Jacob is their father. It is the you know proof that they are um, of the tribe of Israel and such, of the, one of the 12 tribes. A matter of fact, Josephus, who is a well-respected historian, he said this about the Samaritans. He said, the Samaritans claim that their ancestry is from Joseph and Ephraim and Manasseh. So the house of Joseph is the combined houses of Ephraim and Manasseh. So all those tribes kind of come together into Joseph. And the Samaritans are from that line. And so for her to kind of claim that, she's claiming some self-sufficiency there. Being of the tribes of Israel is very important. It's just as important as any other Jew. So, this conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman was emotionally charged to begin with. She's getting a bit defensive and defending herself and talking about these things. Obviously, she's probably dealing with some rejection in her hometown and even with her family and such. Listen, she was drawing water at noon. 
And uh, scholars say that this well that she was at, Jacob's well, was not the closest well to her village. She could have gone to a, a closer location. She could have gone to a, a well that was um, you know, closer, and she could have gone in the morning hours. But nevertheless, she was avoiding people, and she was there in the afternoon hours, and she was farther away. It could possibly be that she had a bad reputation, and people knew of it. She was just tired of hearing the sarcastic comments flung at her, and we know that hurt people hurt people, so she's probably used to defending herself and slinging back sarcastic comments. And this is how she kind of starts a conversation with Jesus and talking about this argument. But Jesus doesn't get drawn into this emotionally charged conversation. And now she's even further driving it home with the fact that you know, we too are important people. Now, as we continue to read how Jesus loves on this lost woman, we can really take some pointers from this. I want you to take note that this woman said this sarcastic comment here in verse 9. But the way that Jesus responds makes it to where she responds back respectfully three different times. She starts off with the word sir in verse 11, and again in verse 15, and then in verse 19. Sir, you have nothing to draw your water with. And sir, um, give me this water. And sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And so how do you minister to lost people? Well, Jesus answered in verse 10 to her sarcastic comment, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And so Jesus takes the conversation from all of these earthly elements to an eternal aspect of living water. And here's what that does. He is clearly portraying the fact that he cares about her eternal destiny. He's not judging her. He's wanting to help her. And that's comprehended. And you see that how the rest of the conversation unfolds wonderfully. Now, she tries to divert the conversation in verse 20. Read with me. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you people say that Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. In the following verses, all the way down to verse 26, is them going back and forth about which mountain and why and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, the mountain which the temple was built on in Jerusalem is, you know, supposed to be the premier place to worship, but yet the Samaritans have built a temple on Mount Gerizim and it was dedicated to Zeus, which, um, you know, the Jews would think that's detestable, but yet is that the place to worship? Is I don't know. An age old battle. But Jesus just kind of answers the question, utilizes the conversation to draw out of her this comment in verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. And so she had some knowledge of what would probably be the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, and Deuteronomy, in that the Messiah was to come. She had some religious knowledge. Jesus draws that out of her by talking about worship and, you know, at which mountain and, and so forth. And then he reveals to her in verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And so get the big picture. Jesus, a Jewish man, walking through Samaria, meets this woman at the well. He doesn't judge her. He starts to lovingly lead her to understand eternal security and salvation. And he's talking with her now right at the point to where he is revealing to her that he is the Messiah, right at the, the highest point of sharing the gospel. Look what happens in verse 27. At this point, the disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Distractions are going to be happening in our life when we share the gospel. Point number three is don't be a distracted disciple. I was with Ray Comfort here recently and had the opportunity to witness how he was witnessing to a young woman from Texas. And, um, and she had fallen under conviction. Tears were coming out of her eyes. She said that uh, she had never heard the gospel presented this way before. And um, it was just the perfect scenario. And right as she was getting close to accept Christ, this guy 
uh, pedaled his bike right up in the middle of the conversation and he had a radio duct taped to his handlebars and it was blaring and it threw everybody off and it just kind of delayed the conversation there. Uh, thank the Lord, another man who was with us, Andrew Rappaport, um, took her side and continued the gospel conversation with her. So nevertheless, we can take comfort in that even when distractions happen, Romans 8, 28 says, God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God. We can take comfort in that. So don't get distracted by the distractions. Just keep on moving forward. Look at the disciples and how they too were thinking more along an earthly line like the woman was and how Jesus reels them back in. This is continuing on with not being a distracted disciple in verse 31 and following. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And so the disciples are thinking about earthly food. Yes, Jesus did send them into the village to buy food and bring it back. And they had been walking all day. They were parched. They were thirsty. They were hungry. And they bring the food back. But here's where they failed. They failed to realize the greater thing that was happening. Jesus was sharing the gift of God, the free gift of salvation with a lost woman. And now they're focused on food. And it kind of derailed the conversation, so it seems to be. And then Jesus responds to them in verse 35. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for the harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for the eternal life so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, he, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. So Jesus is now taking them from the subject of eating lunch to a higher subject, a more spiritual subject of sowing seeds, that which he was just doing, sowing the gospel seeds. And he says, look, the harvest is just white and ready. Look at all the Samaritans here in Samaria. We have got a lot of work to do. So don't get distracted. See past the surface on what's really happening. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says this, Look not at that which is seen, but the things which are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And so Jesus is taking his young learners and teaching them, look past the surface. And I think that we really need to hone in on that lesson too and learn how to love lost people. Look past the surface. Don't see skin deep. Don't see the hair in the clothes or anything else. Don't, don't look at politics or religion. Don't, don't look at where someone is from or anything like that. See right into the depths of their heart and soul and speak to the things of eternity. Point number four, be a dedicated disciple. Be a dedicated disciple. Here in verse 35, do you say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look to the fields. Are they, they are white for harvest. Be a dedicated disciple who is sowing seeds for lost people to be able to come to salvation. Be a person who is dedicated, not distracted. Forget about earthly things. Forget about food and clothing and all the things that we talk about that are all earthly. You know that Colossians 3.2 says to set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. It seems that our American earthly minds are preset to comforts. We're so focused on what makes us feel comfortable, what we want to do, the moment, you know, it's the reason why fast food and such is so popular. Guys, if we could get beyond these earthly distractions and, and look at the soul and look at eternity and look at the things that are going to last forever, the things of this world will strangely grow dim and you won't be 
controlled by the things of this world. You won't be pulled around by your desires. You will actually be controlled by Jesus Christ and you will have higher goals than just what the moment might be able to satisfy for you. That's being a dedicated disciple. We've got to be able to be to become dedicated disciples so that we're faithful. Listen to 1 Timothy 1.15. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. And so Paul writing here to Timothy, whom Timothy would share with his congregation, is saying that Paul is saying that he is, in the King James, the chief of all sinners. And yet Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He's been saved. Now we've got to take the salvation to lost people. So what are the results of this conversation with Jesus um, and the woman at the well? What are the results of this faithfulness? Well, let's read verses 39 to 42. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. Let's pause right there for just a moment. Now, the disciples might have come in and distracted the conversation a little bit, and the woman walked away, and she left and went back home. But obviously, that gospel seed was planted deep enough to where it, it touched her heart, and it sprouted, and she went back, and, and she started to tell other Samaritans about the Christ that she had just met. And they believed, so people are getting saved. He told me the things that I have done. He proved to her that he was the all-knowing Messiah. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And then get this, verse 42, and they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. And so you see the fruit of Jesus' labor. You see how now this uh, wretched woman now goes to save more wretched people or lead people to being saved. And we too are saved by God's amazing grace. Listen, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We're just wretched people trying to reach wretched people indiscriminately. Even the people that mistreat us. Luke 6, 28 says this, Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. This whole ministry journey of Jesus going into Samaria is unheard of. It's unprecedented. And not only for a Jew to go into Samaria is a cultural you know, wrongdoing, but it's also so crazy that Jesus would give a parable that puts a Samaritan in a positive light. Uh, listen to Luke 10, verses 30 to 37. Jesus replied and said, A man is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the robbers. And they stripped him and beat him, and he went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest, someone whom you would think would be a very good man, a priest, was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side, leaving the hurt guy. Verse 32. Likewise, the Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, here it is, who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he came, he saw and felt compassion on him. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him into the inn and took care of him. And on the next day, he took two denarii and gave to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the men who fell among the robbers' hands? And he said, The one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, and this I think is the best point for us all today, Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. So there it is. We should go and do the same. We should take him go out of our way to go to where lost people are, reach out to Samaritan-like folks, expend some of our own personal resources to take care of any needs that they might have, minister to their soul, and lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ, and do our absolute best to sow seeds where the harvest is. 
I hope you've enjoyed today from John chapter 4. We'll continue next week. Let me pray with you as we close out. And Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that we would minister indiscriminately like you have for the Samaritan woman at the well. May we need to go against some cultural norms. May we need to focus more on spiritual things than earthly things. Help us to do that, we pray, for you have saved a wretch like us. We thank you, Jesus, in Christ's name. Amen.